Okay, this is uh, Acoustics 110. We are now looking at Unit 5. We are getting, we are winding on in this course. Unit 4 was on psychoacoustics for the past two weeks. Today we press on in psychoacoustics for the next couple of weeks again, so we're all good here. I hope that you have your notes in front of you while you're watching this because I'm going to pull up things and share now screen. Okay. Oh, I forgot. Let me do that real quick. <laughs> yeah, you got to do that. It's uh, real important that way. That's uh, is that unit six, right? That's unit five. Five. Okay. Yeah, it's called psychoacoustics, loudness, and pitch. And when the notes are pulled up in front of you, that's where you want to be scrawling down and writing down whatever I'm showing you on the PowerPoint slides. I'll go back and forth, as you've seen, and we move back and forth between these things. But this, uh, this unit here, loudness and pitch, it's kind of like the, the perceptual correlate of intensity and frequency. So we covered frequency and intensity before the midterm exam. Well, that's the physics of sound. This is psychoacoustics. So we're looking at loudness and pitch. So loudness kind of corresponds to intensity, and pitch corresponds to frequency. So when you're looking at loudness, okay, we measured, you know, intensity in, in the decibel, dBSPL. I mean, that's how we measured things. Here we're looking at fonds. That's the measurement of loudness. And when I read right here, it says loudness is the psychoacoustic perceptual correlate for physical intensity. Loudness, that we say here, is shown by fawn curves, also called equal loudness curves. Sometimes they're called Fletcher-Munson curves. So I'm just going to highlight right there in the notes. Fawn curves or equal loudness curves or Fletcher-Munson curves. And where do these result from? They result from, as I'm highlighting here, the various resonances of your outer and middle ears. So we kind of looked a little bit at this last week. So let me show a picture of it. So last week, our very first slide here, minimal audible field, what you looked at last week in Unit 4. You've got that yellow curve. You've got the frequency along the horizontal axis. You've got dBSPL along the vertical. And what did we always say zero dBSPL was? If we go to this slide, remember this from way back in, in physics and in intensity, Unit 2? We said, this, what was the softest pressure it took? for a normal hearing human to hear a 1,000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. Remember the three conditions, 1,000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. What was the softest pressure against your eardrum? And we said it was 0 0.002, 0 0.002, three zeros, dynes per centimeter squared. And that was zero dB. SPL. And then we said as you increase the pressure by a factor of 10, you go up 20 dB. And increase it by a factor of 10 again, you go up another 20 dB. Okay, great. Fine. That's 1,000 hertz. What happens if you do that across the frequencies? And it turns out, now watch the white line here, okay? At 1,000 hertz, we called that softest pressure zero. Zero dB SPL. Zero dB SPL. All right. Now, if you play that same game at other frequencies, what happens if you play a 2,000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears? What's the softest it required to hear that? Well, it's actually a little softer. Look where my cursor is. And what about 4,000 hertz? Well, it's even softer yet than zero. So our ears are better at 4,000 hertz. And then at 8,000, no, not as good anymore. And at 500 hertz, not as good anymore. And at 250, not as, not as good. And look at 125. It takes 40 decibels to just barely hear. Okay? So what we've done here is we've dispensed with the pressure units where we said 0, 0, 0, 0002 was 0 dB SPL. So we called that. There you go. And when we play with the other frequencies, look at the curve. And this curve is reminiscent of equalizers. When you look at equalizers, they tend to have the button shaped like a smile, too. Okay? And the curve 
comes from the resonances of your outer and middle ears. We hear some frequencies better than other frequencies. So this deals a lot with anatomy <clears throat> 120. The outer ear canal resonance, which you've got memorized by now, which starts at 1500 hertz and ends at around 4000 hertz with its peak at around 2700 hertz, giving you about a 20 decibel lift. And then we looked at the middle ear unit two in 120, and you've got the fact that the middle ear ossicles resonate at 2000 hertz, so, and the various resonances of the middle ear cavity. So, you put all these things together, and you've got a sweet spot of hearing. And that sweet spot is largely between 1000 and 4000 hertz, right where I'm circling here. And that's 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 got to be good because the most important frequencies for understanding speech are also between 1 and 4,000 hertz. So the ear is made to match and marry to the to speech. Okay, great. So memorize this here, minimal audible field, MAF. It's the softest level required to just barely hear all the frequencies at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. Okay, MAF. We covered this last week, and we're looking at it a little bit differently this week. So watch what happens here. <clears throat> we'll go to our notes now. Now, fawn curves result from various resonances of the outer and middle ears. Back to the slide, you could call all of this curve, that whole yellow curve, you could call that zero fawns. And what do I mean in English? How loudly, remember we're not talking intensity. What was the loudness? Well, what was the loudness of this? And you'd have to say, just barely audible. That's how loud, because it represents the softest it takes to hear a 1000 Hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. So how loud was that? Barely audible, that's how loud. And now look at my cursor here at 500 hertz, right on the yellow, how loud was that? Well, you'd have to say again, just barely audible, that's how loud. And over at 250, my cursor now over top of here, how loud was that? Just barely audible, same with 125. And look at it, it's actually 40 decibels SPL. But how loud did you hear it? Just barely audible. So every dot on the yellow line represents just barely audible. And that means how loud was it? Zero phones. P-H-O-N-S. That's the unit for loudness. Okay? So the whole MAF curve is zero Fawns. Same with the MAP curve that you looked at before last week and the week before. And MAP is simply the softest it takes to hear all the different frequencies with one ear under a headphone. Okay? Same thing. How loud would that be? Zero fawns. Barely audible. Good. Back to our typewriting now. All points along any curve show the relative intensity in dBSPL that it takes to hear all the different frequencies equally loud. Back to the slide again. Every, follow my cursor, every frequency along this yellow line is heard equally loud. How loud? Just barely audible. That's how loud. Okay? Good. Now we're getting somewhere, leave that slide alone. And here's minimal audible field and minimal audible pressure together. Now MAP is the softest it took to hear with one ear under a headphone. Okay, this is out of your textbook, Lass and Woodford. So you can see that, but always know the distinction between these two. MAF is two ears at one meter distance from a speaker. MAP is the softest it took to hear all the different frequencies with one ear under a headphone. Now, why is MAP so short? How come MAF is so long? And when you're looking at that, it's because we don't test hearing under headphones below 
125 hertz. So when you're looking at where my cursor is here, it's at about 125 hertz. And we don't test lower than that. And that's the reason why the MAP curve is shorter than the MAF curve. Okay, so follow that there. That's at 125. Okay, so we don't test lower. So other than that, look at the decibel distance between these two. And it's about 5 dB. And that means, as we covered last week as well, two ears are about 5 dB better than one ear. Two ears are 5 dB better than one ear. So MAP is going to be about 5 dB less sensitive than MAF because you're listening with one ear under a headphone. Very good. Over to the notes. The curve, oh yeah, the resonances, where do they come from? There you go, conchable, adult ear canal, the peak resonance, 2,700 hertz, middle ear ossicles, 2,000 hertz. That is why you have the curves, okay? Curves show that there is a difference between loudness and intensity. Otherwise, they wouldn't be curves, okay? <laughs> if we heard all frequencies equally with equal sensitivity, that would be a flat line. But the fact is, they're curved because we have uneven hearing sensitivity across the frequencies. Now, please remember, too, from last week, okay, this curve, right? In, what I'm tracing right here, this curve is IS underline bold-faced, capital letters, exclamation mark, is 0 dB HL on an audiogram. Okay, so if you went to here, there you go, look at the zero line on the top. There's your audiogram. The zero on the top, right there, okay, right here, that flat line is minimal audible pressure, the curve. Always remember that. Never forget that because those decibel differences are literally built in. These decibel differences are built into the audiometer. So really, zero decibels at 125 hertz, okay? So let's look at here. What is, what is this value? 40. If I go to the end here, 125 hertz, it's called zero there, but in all truth and reality, that's 40 decibels SPL. Okay, we call it zero. We do that on purpose so that we don't have to sit there messing around with curves. Okay, I don't want to call, I don't want to sit there saying with all this uneven hearing sensitivity across the frequency and now go do a hearing test, that sucks. So I'm going to build in these differences into my audiometer. And now that the audiometer contains all those differences, now I can simply test hearing. And I'm calling that whole curve minimal audible pressure. I'm calling it 0 dB HL, 0 decibels hearing level. So remember your decibel references from last week, okay? And I keep saying from last week because here's hoping to God people watched last week's Zoom session because this one hinges on that one, okay? But last week we said the main decibel reference is SPL. That's for the world. That's for hearing aids. That's for machines. That's for everything, okay? The second decibel reference is for the human race. And we're not the whole world. We're in the world. So you got the big decibel reference, dBSPL, dBHL for the human race, and last of all, dBSL for you. <laughs> okay? So the world, the human race, you. So review your, your three decibel references from last week. Very, very important that way. So I'm just kind of taking the time to go slowly that we really give ourselves the time to go through this and know it well. So let's go to our notes again for a second here. Okay, Fons, center around 1,000 hertz. Recall unit two, intensity and the decibel. 0 dBSPL is 0 0.0002 dynes per centimeter squared against your eardrum. 
This is the smallest pressure at your eardrum to hear a 1000 hertz tone at one meter distance with two ears. <coughs> the loudness of all other frequencies are compared to the loudness of a thousand hertz, which was just barely audible. Look at the bottom curve first. But this could be MAF or MAP, it must be stipulated. We will stick to MAF and note the dramatic differences in dBSPL required to just barely hear all the different frequencies. The thresholds for the different frequencies occur at very different intensities of dBSPL. Highlighting the curve. The curve. Look at the cave, okay? Look at the caves. Y'all got curves, okay? Now, here we go. We're going to call MAF, this first slide right here, we're calling that zero fonds. There it is. Okay, it's at the bottom. Now look what happens at the top one. Whoa! So look at the bottom one again. You've got 1,000 hertz, the softest it took to hear 1,000 hertz at one meter distance with two ears. You played that same game. What's the softest level required to hear all the different frequencies at one meter distance with two ears? Now you cranked up 1,000 hertz, and you cranked it up to 120. Look at this. You cranked it up so it's like loud. And then you played a 2,000 hertz tone until it sounded as loud. Or you turned a 500 hertz tone up until it sounded as loud. And a 1,000, a 100 hertz tone until it sounded as loud. And look at the top there. They, the curves kind of flatten out. Hmm. Weird. Okay. The area between your bottom and top curves is your football playing field. Okay. The bottom one is the softest you could just barely hear. And remember, all points along this bottom curve sound equally loud, okay? How loud? Just barely audible. That's how loud. And then, because yeah, you're comparing everything to 1,000 hertz, okay? You're playing, you're playing the same game as you did with 1,000 hertz. You're playing the 500 hertz tone until it's barely audible. You're playing a 100 hertz tone until it's barely audible. So they all sound equally loud. Now you're playing a game with really loud. You're cranking 1,000 hertz up to 120. And now you're playing 2,000 hertz until it sounds equally loud to, that, to this frequency here. Wouldn't you hate to be part of that experiment? My God, what a drag. I, mean, I wouldn't wish that one on my worst enemy. Here we go. I'm going to crank up 1,000 hertz. Now you, how loud does that sound? Yeah, that, that's loud. Okay, and I'm going to crank up another tone. You tell me when it sounds just as loud as that one. Yikes. Well, that's what they did. And what did they find? Look at this. The decibel distance between the top and bottom curves is smaller than it is in the middle. And you know why that's important? That has everything to do with ghetto blasters and boom boxes and loudness switches and bass boost. Have you ever gotten a radio and played this or a radio that's a half decent size? You paid, I don't know, 50 bucks, 100 bucks for it. And it'll have a bass boost button on it. And when do you push the bass boost button? When the volume is soft because your ears aren't as sensitive to the low frequencies. So you gotta give them a boost. And yet when you crank up the volume, you don't need the bass boost anymore. And that's because your fawn curves flatten out at the top. Whereas at the bottom, they're curved. You need that bass boost. And you can go now, if you want to have a fun time this evening, go to a radio store or some whatever place that sells high, you know, TV and radio equipment and ask the salesperson, how come there's that bass boost button? What does that do? Why do we have that? And then you'll watch the person turn into a massive white protoplasm because they don't know. <laughs> They're just a sales clerk working at the store, but you do because you've taken psychoacoustics. So it's kind of weird. It's a, this is the kind of weird stuff that is that exists in our field that way. And it's important to kind of have a grasp, a, a graph, you know, how that is. So, share screen. Here we are.
So there's that. What you, why you'd need that bass boost at soft volume levels, whereas you don't need the bass boost at louder volume levels. So we'll read here. It says, look at the top curve next. This is loudness discomfort across the frequencies. Note how the top curve flattens out. There's less differences in decibels required to hear all the different frequencies uncomfortably loud. So I'll show you the picture again. There's less decibel differences across the frequencies to hear all the different frequencies uncomfortably loud. This is your floor. This is your ceiling of loudness tolerance. And the decibel distance between them is called your dynamic range. Dynamic range always refers to the decibel distance. It's like your thermometer. It's the difference between freezing and boiling across the frequencies. When is it just audible? When does it hurt? When is it just audible? When does it hurt? And notice the decibel distance gets wider as you get toward the middle and the highs. It's narrower in the lows. That's just a fact of life. It's the way God planned it. So here you go. Decibel dynamic range is the term for the area between the top and the bottom fawn curves. Note that the curves are closest together for the lows. This is our football field of hearing, our area or decibel distance between threshold or too loud. Note that it's smaller for the lows than for the highs. So look what I put in italics right here. In a way then, loudness can be said to grow more rapidly for the smaller dynamic range, literally like a seed into a sapling into a tree. Loudness grows from being barely audible to being uncomfortably loud. It grows more quickly because your dynamic range is smaller there. The growth of loudness is much slower in the mid frequencies because your dynamic range is bigger there. Okay, these are things to note. Now, let's look at the 40 fawn curve. And Richard Trowbridge is going, what the heck is that? Well, let's look at that. Geez, I'm glad you showed up, though, Richard, because if you hadn't, I'd be yakking in a computer by myself, which is always such a drag. We've All often right. had another person attending. Karen McMacken has often showed up. She's out in Maryland, and she's usually the one person that has shown up on these 110 Zoom sessions. But she probably she didn't today, but you did. So I'm real glad you did. So here we go. Let's look at the 40 fawn curve. There's, here's one stuck in the middle. Now, what did we do here? All we did was we turned 1,000 hertz up, up, up to about 40 decibels. Now, 40 decibels, SPL, isn't very loud. 40 decibels is kind of soft. Because what's average conversational speech? About 60 to 70. What's yelling? Around 80 to 90. What's ambient room noise? About 35 to 40. So 40 dB is kind of soft, but it's there. You can hear it. It's, it's there. Okay. So there it sits, 40. And what did we do now? Well, we took a 500 hertz tone and we turned it and we said, when does that sound equally loud to the 1000 hertz tone at 40? And then we played a 250 hertz tone. And we said, when does that sound equally loud to the 1000 hertz tone at 40? And then we played a 100 hertz tone. And we said, when does that sound equally loud to the 1000 hertz tone at 40? And then we went over at 10,000 hertz. And we said, when does that sound equally loud to the 1000 hertz tone at 40? at 40. Everything is anchored to the 1000 hertz tone at 40. And so again, every point along this middle curve sounds equally loud. How loud? As loud as the 1000 hertz tone did at 40 dB. Okay, so e all sounds on the bottom curve sound equally loud. How loud? Just barely audible. All sounds in the middle curve sound equally loud. How loud? As loud as the 1000 hertz tone did at 40. 
all sound points along the top curve sound equally loud. How loud? As loud as the 1000 hertz tone did at 120. So everything is anchored to the 1000 hertz tone. Notice that the 1000 hertz is always at the 120. Here, at 40, at zero. And then the, the, the rest of the curves are showing the intensity that the other frequencies needed to be to sound equally loud to the 1000 hertz anchor. Okay, so that's the 40 fawn curve. Shoot, people do, do them all. Okay, here's the 40 curve. People did it at 50, they did it at 60, they did it at 70, and you got a whole mess of lines here. But notice, the bottom one is the most curved, the top ones are more flattened out. So this is a complicated one showing you here of, of mine. I'm just showing you the top and bottom here. This one here is showing you everything in between. And this one here is picking on 40. Okay? Why are we picking on 40? Because 40 is called one sone. S-O-N-E. One sone. Now, you're going to see this below in your notes, but that's okay. Right now, I'm not even looking at the notes. I'm just going to look at you, and you got to look at me with my bad hair day. Okay, here we go. One zone is pretty soft. How loud is that? As loud as a 1,000 hertz tone at 40 dB SPL, which is barely above ambient room noise. Well, if you go into a hardware store and you want to buy a fan, for over top of your stove and you want to pay some bucks okay so you're going to pay down maybe 200 bucks 150 bucks for a decent stove top fan that's going to suck up the air from cooking your dinner okay that fan if you look at the specs it's going to be one zone you paid money and you paid you get what you pay for and the fan is quiet it's one zone Mind you now, let's say you've got a, a cabin out in the wilderness somewhere and you got a Johnny on the spot out there and you figure, ah, shoot, you just want to throw in a fan just to kind of clear the air. Well, then you'll buy it. You'll pay 10 bucks for a fan. And guess what? You get what you pay for. Because when you look at the specs, it's going to be three zones. <laughs> okay? So zones are actually used in specs of equipment to talk about how loud they are. And especially in air conditioners, fans, fridges, just kitchen equipment. So you don't want it noisy. The, the, the best equipment is soft. So you, and the best example I can give you is stovetop fans compared to a cheap bathroom fan. And you will see this when you look it up in specs. And that's what zones are used for. That's so that you can say, hey, this is twice as loud as or half as loud as, okay? So when we go back to share screen now, let's just look at, look at our notes at what you see here. So the loudness of this right here, a thousand hertz tone at 40 dB, they call that loudness 40 fawns, and they also call that one zone. Okay, let's look at our notes. Look at the 40 curve fawn. A 1000 hertz tone at 40 dB SPL is heard, and the listener judges its loudness. This is called 40 fawns. Any other hertz heard at the same loudness is also 40 fawns. So every point on this curve is 40 fawns. Okay? Every frequency is heard equally loud. How loud? As loud as a 1000 hertz tone did at 40. So every dot on that curve is 40 fawns. Every dot on the bottom curve is zero fawns. Every dot on the top curve is 120. Fine. Okay. The curves generally flatten out as the intensity increases. Yep, we know that too. Covered it. Okay. Fawn curves and equalizers. Well, let's see if I got a picture of an equalizer here. There you go. There's a picture of an equalizer. Told you, 
So when you go into a bar and a band is playing and you got so you got your the, the technician at the back corner of the bar who's changing the, who's adjusting the acoustics for the room and he's got or he, she's got these buttons and look at that they're usually shaped like a smile. And that's because of the fawn curves. I didn't make it up. Okay, that's the reality. You listen to some person's car with a bump, 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 and all that music coming out or whatever, and if the person's a real musical file, you he or she will have an equalizer. And you're literally shaping the frequency response. A bass boost is a poor man's equalizer. Simply, simply, it's just jamming up the bass. It's not doing anything to the highs, but anyway. All right, so... Fawn curves and equalizers for soft music. To hear all frequencies equally loud, you need an artificial boost of mainly the lows and a little bit of some highs. Equalizer buttons are often shaped like or set like a smile. The loudness or bass boost on boom boxes is really a poor man's equalizer. Okay, so make sure when you're looking at your notes and as you're studying here, highlighting where I've highlighted here, okay, especially here, we'll just go look at a thousand hertz tone at 40 dB SPL is heard, a listener judges its loudness, and this is called 40 fawns. Any other frequency heard at the same loudness is also 40 fawns. For example, a 50 hertz tone at 40 fawns has to be over 60 dB SPL. Let's look at that. A 50 hertz tone, a 50 hertz tone, look at 50. It's got to be about 60 freaking decibels in order to sound equally loud to the 1000 hertz tone at zero. Okay, this is what I'm asking you to internalize or digest. You know, it's kind of kind of freaky, kind of weird. Always remember dBSPL is your physical intensity. What was the intensity? What was the pressure of sound against your eardrum? And psychoacoustic says, okay, let's play that with other frequencies. And you will notice that the ear is much more sensitive to these frequencies that I'm circling. And look at how that minimal audible field line curve even goes below zero. Okay, right here, below zero. Meaning our ears are really sensitive to sounds between one and 4,000 hertz. You betcha, that's the sweet spot. Due to the resonances of our outer ear, due to the resonances of our middle ear. But if I played a 50 hertz tone, man, I got to jack that sucker up to about 60 decibels SPL for that tone to be just barely audible. Okay? So remember, every frequency along the bottom curve is heard equally loud. How loud? Barely audible. Every frequency along the middle curve is heard equally loud. How loud? As loud as 1,000 hertz tone did at 40 dB. And the same with the top curve. Everything sounds equally loud here. How loud? As loud as a 1,000 hertz tone at 120. Great. And then we moved it down to zones. There's what I talked about earlier. Sones. Look again at the 40 fawn curve. A normal listener, listener judges the loudness of a 1000 hertz tone at 40. And the loudness of a 1000 hertz tone is 40 fawns then. This is called one zone. So, zones allow one to say something is twice as loud. Now look at how I wrote loud. L-O-D. Twice as loud. Sones allow us to, one to say something is twice as loud as, or half as loud as, okay? And again, put an asterisk by that, put a star by that. Sones allow you to say something is twice as loud as, or half as loud as, or three times as loud as. So for example, a cheap fan is gonna be loud. It's gonna sound about twice or three times as loud as a good fan. Okay, a good fan is at one zone, a cheap one might be three zones. It sounds three times as loud. Good. We're covering some good territory, and that's all the stuff about loudness. Now I'll introduce you to its counterpart called 
pitch. Pitch. Hmm. Let's talk about the top quarter of page two right here. And then we'll be done for today. Okay, so let's look at the top of page two. Pitch. Subjective perception of frequency. Not the subjective perception of loudness anymore. No, no. Subjective perception of frequency. You see, the scientist is going to talk about <clears throat> intensity, frequency, and the, uh, <clears throat> the music teacher is going to talk about loudness and pitch. Okay? So the scientist talks about frequency and intensity. The artsy farts talks about loudness and pitch. One's the physics, one's the perception. So we've covered a lot of the, about, about loudness, fawns, zones, equal loudness curves, all that. Now let's move on to its counterpart called pitch. And when you do that, we'll go to our notes here and look at pitch. Subjective perception of frequency. In general, the higher the frequency, the higher our perception of pitch. Duh. Yeah, no kidding. Pitch depends mostly on frequency, but it also depends a little bit on intensity and duration. But nonetheless, don't worry about that. Look at this. A doubling of frequency does not necessarily correspond to a doubling of pitch perception. Yes, as frequency goes up, pitch goes up. Yeah, no kidding. Okay? But it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one thing. So let's look at a picture of what we mean there. Let's move on to here. Oh, yeah. This is showing you 40 fawns, and we call that one zone. Okay, so we, but we covered that. Look at this. Pitch is measured in something called MELS. Short for a guy's name, Melvin? I don't know. M-E-L. The MEL scale. So watch this. A thousand hertz. Follow my cursor. A thousand hertz. And we'll play that so a person hears that tone. And we'll say, okay, memorize the pitch of that. Just, just kind of get an idea as to the pitch of that. Just to, what does that sound like to you? Okay, keep that memory up, keep that in your head. All right? Now, <clears throat> I'm going to play a 2,000 hertz tone. Does that sound twice as high in pitch? Not really. It sounds about one and a half times as high in pitch. Hmm. What sounds twice as high in pitch? What sounds at two, th this, this is Mel's, this, this axis here, this is frequency here. So let's look at 2,000 Mel's. Du, 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 du. What frequency is that? Down, down, down. Shoot, that's about between 2,000 and 5,000. My gosh, you're close, you're somewhere between three and 4,000 hertz. So when you're playing a 1,000 hertz tone, you've got to play about a 3,000, 5, 3 or 4,000 hertz tone, and that, that one will sound to you like it's twice as high in pitch. Okay? Same with this one. Same picture. This, this here and this here are similar things. Okay? A 1,000 hertz tone is heard at a, at a pitch of 1,000 mels. A 2,000 hertz tone does not sound twice as loud. It sounds about one and a half times. It's not as loud, as high in pitch. It sounds about one and a half times higher in pitch. If I wanted to find a sound that's twice as high in pitch, I'm going to go to 2,000 mels, follow my cursor, and I work myself down from there, and it's going to be somewhere between two to 5,000 hertz. Again, telling you the same story as we did here. For a sound to be twice as high in pitch, if I follow that and work my way down, I'm somewhere between two and 5,000 hertz. So remember, with pitch as well, the anchor is always 1,000 hertz. What was the pitch at 1,000 hertz? Okay, now let's increase the frequency until we've got to a frequency that sounds twice as high in pitch. 
subjectively, remember the subjectively, psychoacoustics is your heart. It's what you think. It's what you feel. It's what it sounds like. It's not what it is. It's what it is to you subjectively. Okay? So what tone sounds to you twice as high as the 1000 hertz tone does in pitch? Well, you'll go, if a 1000 hertz tone is heard as a, at a pitch of 1000 mels, that's your anchor. What's the frequency of a tone that sounds to you twice as high in pitch? And if you're looking at 2,000 mels, because that's the representative of pitch, and you work yourself over and find what the true reality is in objective hertz, it's going to be not 2,000 hertz, it's going to be higher than 2,000 hertz. So again, we say that yes, as, as you go higher up in frequency, your pitch perception obviously goes up as well. But it is not repeat not, N-O-T, underline, bold-faced, italics, a one-to-one -one relationship. And the Mel scale tells us this, okay? The Mel, the unit for pitch perception. And look at here, put a star by this. A doubling of frequency does not necessarily correspond to an exact doubling of pitch perception. Mel is the unit of measurement for pitch, just like fawns and sones were units of measurement for loudness. A thousand mels is a pitch of a thousand hertz tone at played at 40 dB SPL. Two thousand mels is a tone that sounds twice as high in pitch. 500 mels would be a sound, the pitch of a tone that sounds twice as low in pitch. Note that 2,000 mels is actually around 1,500 hertz, not 2,000 hertz. And 500 mels is actually close to 400 hertz, not 500 hertz. Let's do that. Let's look at it. Whoops, 500 mels, a sound that is half as high in pitch to you subjectively. If you looked at that frequency, it's actually not exactly 500 hertz. It's more like 400 hertz. See? That's all I mean to tell you in your notes like that. So now we're done the discussion of pitch perception. So this didn't take as long as loudness perception. But always remember the correlation between <clears throat> intensity and loudness is not one-to-one, -one, and the correlation between frequency and pitch is not one-to-one. -one. Loudness, or I should say intensity and frequency are physics, and loudness and pitch are psychoacoustics. And the first half of the course we looked at physics. The second half of the course we're looking at psychoacoustics. Okay, very good. Now we can wind on and look at our notes here, and we'll more, I'm more going to tell you what we'll cover next week. Okay, so looking at what's something we call frequency resolution. Now, we won't get much into this here, except to say that like keys on a piano, okay, if you look at your cochlea, your inner ear, and you, we say, oh, the high frequencies are at the base of the cochlea. Remember that? And the low frequencies are at the apex of the cochlea. Remember that? Well, when you get hair cell damage, what do you lose? You lose your frequency resolution. Yes, you lose your, <clears throat> you need more intensity to hear. Yep, so you lose intensity. Sure you do. But you also lose the ability to distinguish between frequencies close together. So now look what happens to your piano keys. They just got fatter. Okay? Mm -hmm. You've lost your frequency res of friggin You Now your piano keys are fatter. Okay? You have, you have less fineness. To put it in plain English, you can no longer hear the difference between a thousand hertz and a thousand and one hertz, or a thousand hertz and a thousand and five hertz. You need a bigger difference between the two frequencies 
for you to tell that there's a difference. Mm -hmm. And that kind of relates to what we described at the beginning of Unit 4, a couple of weeks ago, when we talked about differential threshold. Remember that? We talked about absolute threshold versus differential threshold. And we said absolute threshold is what you do in clinic. What's the softest it takes for a person to hear the tone under headphones? And he pushes a button or raises a hand. Absolute threshold. Did he hear it or did he not? When you hot you hot, when you not you not. Okay? Did you hear it or did you not? That's differential threshold. And what are we using when we did that? The method of limits, right? Where you're raising and lowering the decibels in fixed increments, and you, the clinician, are doing it, and the client is not. And we said, what method of the method of limits do we use? We said we use the Hewson Westlake ascending descending approach, right? Good. But remember in your notes in Unit 4, the very top of your notes, we described something called differential threshold. And we called that just noticeable difference, or difference Lyman, or delta F. And that meant you already hear the tone, but what's the smallest difference I need to make for you to tell that there was a difference? Would that, would, did I, could I make it 1,001 hertz and could, were you able to go, oh, I hear, no. Or did I have to make it 1,020 hertz for you to tell that there was a difference from 1,000 hertz, okay? So looking at the, make sure you tie this together, what I'm talking about now with the very top of your notes in unit four. And that deals with frequency resolution. The ability to distinguish between frequencies close together. Recall differential threshold, specifically JND, just noticeable difference, or delta F, the triangle F, or difference Lyman for frequency. In other words, frequency discrimination is the ability to detect changes in frequency. Not did you hear it or did you not? You already hear it, but what kind of change did I need to make for you to notice a change? And delta F is the smallest it takes <clears throat> to hear the differences among the frequencies. And our ability to do this is best for the lowest and mid frequencies. It gets way worse for the high frequencies. And I think I even might have a graph showing you a picture of that too. I may not, I'm not sure. <clears throat> I might, may or may not. This is all good for us. Look at, yeah, here's a picture. Delta F, frequency. <clears throat> Don't worry about all the different lines. Those are just representing different intensities. But just look at the, the, this one here. Delta F is smallest, delta F along the vertical is smallest for the low to mid frequencies. It gets way bigger for the high frequencies. In English, this means if I play you a high pitched tone, I need to make a bigger frequency difference for you to recognize that there's a difference. Whereas if I'm playing you a lower frequency tone, I don't have to make as big a difference in frequency for you to notice that there's a difference in frequency, okay? <clears throat> and the reason, look at this now, hair cells, normal, damaged. Uh -huh. Outer hair cells, the active mechanism. Look at this picture dance. Look at the, look at the hair cells especially the outers, right where I'm circling here. Look at these outer hair cells and look at how they are shrinking and they pull this tectorial membrane down so that these inner hair cell hairs can get bent. Are you looking closely at this picture? Okay, because we are going to be covering this as well in our future Zoom sessions in 120 Anatomy. Okay, <clears throat> and I'll be beginning this in about a little bit more than an hour from now. But this is where the unity of these two courses comes together. Because when you lose outer hair cells, look what they're doing. They are mechanically stretching and shrinking to help the tectorial membrane push against the inner hair cells. So they do this 
and they wear out first. And that's why outer hair cells die before inner hair cells. And when you lose outer hair cells, now look at the wave of action that takes place in your cochlea. We'll look at this in 120. Don't worry about it. If they're freaking at this, don't. <clears throat> this is the, <clears throat> excuse me, the floor upon which the hair cells sit. And notice it gets wider at the narrow apex of the cochlea, and it's narrower at the wide base of the cochlea. We covered that last week, anatomy. Okay, and you have your hair cells all along here, but look at how dull and rounded this peak is. So this person can't tell the difference between all of these frequencies where my little cursor is moving. Whereas if you've got working outer hair cells, look at what happened to your wave of action of, mo of motion in the cochlea. It got sharpened. It got, this guy can, C-A-N, can distinguish between tiny frequencies differences. This guy can't. This guy can hear normally. This guy can't. This guy's traveling wave of action in the cochlea, we'll cover this more in 120, but is taller. This guy's is smaller. This guy's is sharper. This guy's is more rounded. Okay? This guy hates hearing aids because hearing aids can't sharpen. Hearing aids can amplify, but they can't sharpen. So there's all kinds of things we will, and I'll start on this next week, of course, in this one too. I'm just giving you a preview as to where we're going next week in unit five in psychoacoustics. So the travel, the wave of action in the cochlea, we'll be describing that in 120 in a little bit more than an hour from now. And without the outer hair cells, it's dull and rounded. With the outer hair cells, it's taller and sharper. So if you play two frequencies close together, you're going to get two peaks of action in the cochlea. If you lose outer hair cells, they're smaller and more rounded. If you take a hearing aid and put it on that person, you're going to get a bigger, dull wave of action. But this third one here isn't the top one. Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Okay? The egg broke. And that's your cochlea. And that's why hearing aids for the ears aren't like glasses for the eyes. And that is why the whole action here, what happens is you lose frequency resolution. You've lost outer hair cells, and so the action in your cochlea is more dull and rounded. To put it in, in, an, al in an analytical way or in an allegorical way, it's like, here we go, your piano keys got fatter. Okay, you've lost the ability to distinguish between frequencies close together. Hearing aids pick up background noise. The hearing aid wearer has a harder time distinguishing between speech and background noise than the normal hearing person does. Why? Because he's lost frequency resolution. He's lost this delta F, his difference Lyman, his just noticeable difference. His differential threshold has gotten worse. He needs a bigger change in order to recognize that there is a change, especially across the frequency domain. Then we will start with this again next week. I'll stop sharing here, and we'll terminate this session now. I'll stop recording, and we will talk in 120 at around, I believe it is, at 1.30 Central Time, which is 11.30 Pacific Time, my time. Okay, adios amigos, over and out. I'm going to stop recording and tune out of this session now. Cheers. Thank See you. you later. Thank you, sir. Okay.